Hi there. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve. I'm a member of the Congregation of Restored Community Church that meets at Woodford in Canfield Chapel. And I've been asked to talk to you this week to continue the series about Messy Church. It's based on Paul's letters to the Corinthian church, and we're looking at lawsuits amongst believers. Now, it's the passage where Paul is giving instructions um, to believers who are pursuing legal action, taking other believers to court. Now, first of all, I'm going to give us some background because the Roman legal system was very different in some ways drastically different to our legal system. And so we need to, to know this so, and understand what the legal system was like so that then we can understand what St. Paul was saying and why he was saying it. Now, a disclaimer, I'm not a legal historian and the subject of Roman, Roman law is huge and enormous. Um, and so, in some ways, I'm only skating over the surface. But the first thing that you have to realise is that not everybody had a right to use the Roman legal system. The empire was full of slaves. And if you were a slave, you didn't have any rights whatsoever. You were at the mercy of your owner, and your only value lay in the price that you would fetch on the open market. And things were only slightly better if you were a freedman who wasn't a Roman citizen, because you had some rights to litigation, but they were very limited. So it's not surprising that within the Roman society as a whole, the community played a greater part in regulating the behaviour of its members and dealing with disputes. The modern view of everybody being equal before the law wasn't accepted or widely applied. So in Roman society terms, the best thing to be was a Roman citizen. But even if you were a Roman citizen, there were disincentives to using the legal system. The gloves were off and it was considered fine for personal attacks on the character of the plaintiff or defence to take place whether these att attacks were true or not. There was no fact-checking in a Roman law court. The, the lawyer could say whatever he liked, whether he had a basis for it or not. So in a society like the Roman society, where your reputation was ex of extreme importance and, and value, you would think twice before going to court and subjecting your reputation to a process which could very well affect it negatively for years to come. So what options were there to settle a dispute? Well, a common acquaintance or a friend could be asked to mediate or arbitrate informally. Or there might be a more formal form of arbitration where both parties agreed to be bound by the decision of the arbitrator at the outset. Whichever course you took, there were additional uh, considerations to take into account. Because as well as the cost, possible cost to your reputation, you may well have to travel. Travel and stay until the case was settled. And the financial implications could be huge. If you had to travel to Rome, say, and the trial lasted a couple of weeks, during all that time you had to pay for your food, you had to pay for your accommodation. And also it meant that while you were away taking part in the legal process, your job back at home in some village or town somewhere else, no one was doing it. You were losing out on income. So clearly, the Roman legal system was stacked in favour of the Roman citizen, and particularly Roman citizens who were wealthy and influential. 
Those who had time and money to pursue a case, as well as the kind of connections in society, to safeguard their reputation. So with this over, over background, overarching background information, let's have a look at the passage. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. And Paul writes this, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So what was Paul addressing? Why was he writing to the Corinthians? Well, believers had complaints, disputes and grievances against each other. And they were going through the secular legal system to try to settle those disputes. Now, we don't know what these complaints were, but we can have a guess. Societies may change, technology may advance, but people are still people with the possibility of disagreement and the whole range of human emotions to fuel it. They had a human experience just like we do. So it could have been a family dispute. It could have been a dispute over property. It could have been disputes about an agreement which one party didn't feel the other had, been kept, had kept. Well, knowing what we do of the Roman legal system, it's no wonder that Paul was counselling against litigation. The definite possibility of having one's dirty linen, either real or imagined, being on public show for the court of popular opinion wasn't a positive move for anyone. And we know that it was costly, both in terms of time and money, to go through the legal process. So the litigants must have been quite wealthy and possibly high-profile church members. Paul's advice in verse 5, to find someone within the church to help settle the dispute, to agree an arbiter, was, as we've seen, one of the options to settle a dispute in the Roman world. And Paul writes very strongly in verse 7. And another version puts it like this. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. And he also says, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? And then he adds to it by saying, why not let yourselves be cheated? They all hint at what Paul expands on later in chapter 13 when he writes about the primacy of love dictating what we do. Because you're not able to accept injustice and leave it at that, and you're not able to let yourself be cheated unless you love. For us, as well as for the Corinthians, there has to be a way to understand justice in the light of the supremacy given to love. Paul is talking about how Christians should relate to one another. So what does this look like through the lens of faith, hope and particularly love? 
Well, ultimately, Paul is calling Christians, as he so often does, and as Jesus did, to live counterculture. As far as the non-Christian world is concerned, Christians don't quite fit in. It's how the Israelites in the Old Testament were called to live, distinct from the nations around them. And one of the issues that we see being addressed time and time again in the Old Testament is the fact that it's often difficult to discern any difference between the people of God and the nations around them. As Israel, often under the leading, sadly, of their kings, followed worship practices of other nations. So let's be specific and consider, first of all, how the world, the non-Christian world, might conduct itself. And then we'll flip it and contrast how we as Christians should conduct ourselves. So in no particular order, and there are probably many other things that could be said in this he heading. But factionalism. In the non-Christian world, factionalism is a thing. What I mean is that you connect with people who agree with you. You spend time with them. You talk with them. You have your own views reinforced, whether they're right or wrong, whether there are other points of view or not. And with your group of people, you take every opportunity to speak ill of and denigrate those who don't agree with you. Social media provides the ideal platform for this to thrive. Or it could be that you take the view of feather in your own nest because you can't rely on anyone else to. And so the assumption behind this is that that's how everybody behaves, so you're justified in behaving that way too. Or another view in the world is that you hold tightly to what you've got, whether it's money, whether it's property, whether it's your job, the list could go on. You hold on to it tightly because it's yours. You don't let it go and you're a fool if you lose it. Another view, very common in the world, is that you're the only one that's right, and everybody else is therefore wrong. And because everybody else is wrong, they need to know it. And so you have to be the loudest and most controlling voice in the room. Or, Another view is that you kick a person when they're down. And that's because you have to be wary of others. So if they're subject to misfortune, you make the most of the opportunity. After all, you don't want them to gain a position where they might challenge you. Now, I'm not saying that you can't be thoughtful and considerate if you aren't a Christian. I'm saying that just saying that the prevailing culture in society can be negative. And so much so that we're often surprised if someone behaves kindly. We tend not to be surprised by negative behavior. Now, as Christians, our allegiance isn't to the world, but to the kingdom of heaven, governed by the principles of faith, hope and love. So how should the citizen of heaven conduct themselves? Again, in no particular order, but we're called to live at peace with everyone. With everyone, not just those who like us or share our views or who we like or who we get on with. Romans 12 verse 18 says this. So while we might not agree with other people, we don't speak ill of them. In the kingdom, we treat others well and we expect them to treat us well in return. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. If they don't, we forgive. We stick to our guns and come in the opposite spirit and continue to treat them well. We recognise that everything that we have is a gift from God our Father. Finance, job, home, family, health, you name it, it's a gift from God. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 14 and James 1 verse 17 say this. And even if we attain things because of our effort or merit, we hold lightly to what we have and we are ready to let it go and be generous. We do to others as we would have them do to us. This can be found both in Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 and Luke chapter 6 verse 31. So we listen because we would like people to listen to us. We value because we would like people to value us. And we support because we would like people to support us. If someone's down, we hold out a hand, either physically or metaphorically, to lift them up. Now, we're able to behave in this way because of our relationship with God our Father. We recognise how he treats us and we show in our behaviour and our attitudes that we are his children. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, you have been obedient to the truth and purified your souls until you can love like brothers in sincerity. Let your love for each other be real and from the heart. So, what's our response? When we look at ourselves by God's standards, how do we measure up? How do we measure up to the standards of the kingdom of heaven? When I was talking about some of the standards in the world, was there something that you recognised in yourself? Do you want to be better at displaying the kingdom of heaven's attitudes? For our response time, I'm going to give some time for reflection. And then, if you wish, you can join me as I say a prayer of repentance. Repentance is a good starting point for when we feel that we've not behaved as well as we should. And then join me, if you would like, in a prayer asking God to help us to be more true to our nature as children of God. So you might want to close your eyes. Father God, I recognise that I've not always lived as a child of God, that I've done things that show my attitude is no different to that of the world around me. I'm sorry and ask that you would forgive me. Amen. And now, a prayer on focusing on going forward. Father God, I thank you for your love and your grace that I am able to live a new life. Let the Holy Spirit lead me in your ways to think, act and react as you would. That I would live each day showing love towards others and giving glory to you. Amen. Thank you for letting me share this morning. If there's been anything that uh, you feel you'd like to talk to someone about, 
then if you phone or email, you can be put in touch with someone who'll be happy to talk with you and to pray for you. Thank you.